what, of course, tradition, I think we can all understand this, what traditional allegory and modern critical method chiefly share is, in common is their awareness of an insufficiency and even the nonsensicality of a purely literalist approach to scripture. Um, now, that said, some of my, the, the historical, the, some of the modern critical scholars of scripture I know personally and like are themselves, in a, in a different sense, very literalist readers. They, they, it's just that they happen to think it's possible that by, to exhaust, as I said, the significance of a text by reconstructing its material history. And once they've done that, there's no other meaning that it's legitimate to find in a text in any context for any reason. They don't always put it that way, but they practice it that way. Uh, but in a different and more important sense, the critical project in biblical studies was a necessary and fortunate, if in some ways inadequate, corrective, not to ancient vi vision views of scripture, but to an early modern reading of the Bible. Uh, a, a, a tradition that treated scripture in what I can only call uh, the oracularist, literalist fashion. Now, what I'm about to say, wildly oversimplified, but my, my excuses are time is limited, and, and again, I'm not awake. Um, as movements towards reform took shape in the early modern period, and as the unity of Christendom began to disintegrate, the rapid decay of any credible institutional warrant for the particulars of Christian belief was, had to be compensated for by the elevation of the canonical text of the Bible to a position of doctrinal authority conceptually prior, I mean absolutely prior in some sense to any act of interpretation. This was inevitable and it required the myth of the Bible as a kind of infallible and uniform catalog of direct divine revelations, not a testament to revelation. And it's funny, when you read say the Cappadocian Fathers or Origen or Augustine, how, you notice how often when they speak of scripture they speak of it as revealing the, what is revealed, as, as referring as, as a testament to a revelation. It's very rare you find them speaking of the text of scripture as revelation itself. Um, no, but you do on some occasions. But, um, it, 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 you know, it, not a testament to revelation, not simply a revealed text in the sense that by God's grace it points to the full revelation of God in Christ, but in some sense as an immediate communication of the concrete truths of salvation history, of doctrine uncorrupted by human connivance or folly, and of divine oracles dictating to us what to believe, to desire, to do. And this was true not only of Protestant theological culture, but, but all, much of the, of the emerging Catholic counterparts as well. You, you never, for instance, have had the controversy between um, Urban and Galileo a century earlier. It wouldn't have been an issue. Now. Uh, what this also meant was that the interpretation of scripture could be understood essentially, should be understood as transcription, direct transcription. The question it must address is not what is the Holy Spirit saying to us through the text, but more simply, what is the text telling us? And it's not always, and it's never in practice possible to separate those things absolutely. And this question could be asked honestly only if the interpreter scrupulously refrained from any unseemly impulse to presume upon grace by reading into the text what the text did not explicitly warrant it. Now, at a practical level, you can ne such a reading is impossible in some sense. It can never be done with absolute purity of intention and method. And that was why it was necessary to rely to so great a degree on the myth of the uniform text, the Bible whose true author was simply God speaking through his amanuenses. In the end, even though even those who sought to hear and obey the word of scripture could not really help but impose upon the plain and literal sense meanings and acceptations and typological iterations that were in fact inherited from a doctrinal tradition which had in its turn, turn arrived at its understanding of scripture, scripture by way of a radically different practice of reading. Which is, only, which is a rather long-winded way of saying that the early modern readings of scripture were actually um, uh, dependent upon ancient readings of scripture that shared none of their pre premises about what the text was doing uh, in revealing Christ. Over the course of the modern period, many Christians lost any sense then that the act of interpreting scripture, as it was understood 
say by the church fathers as a rule, is itself something inspired. The Bible may be inspired in the sense of dictated, but to read is chiefly to register what is written. Now, that's not to say any Christian exegete of the early modern period suggested that the reader of the Scripture did not have to be guided by the Holy Spirit. I'm not, I'm not um, making that claim. I will assert, though, that within the modern understanding of reading, what this principally means is the Spirit must guide the reader towards the one correct interpretation of the text, which will be consistent with every other reading and every other part of the text. This at least functions as a tacit presupposition in any attempt to deduce the entirety of Christian revelation from the text of scripture in abstraction from the concrete history of the church and of doctrinal debate and of spiritual life. The whole truth really must be there in the ink, on the page, in the words of the text, merely waiting to be enucleated by the obedient hearers of the word. Now, in the allegorical tradition, one can't make that distinction. Uh, it, it simply wasn't made that clearly between the written text and the reader where, insp where, where inspiration is concerned. In that tradition, the reader of the Bible, the hearer of the word, is not necessarily being led by the Spirit towards the single correct meaning of the text, but towards a true reading of the text in harmony with the mind of the church, illuminated by the grace of the Holy Spirit and testifying to Christ. But that does not mean the exclusively true or exclusively correct meaning of that text. Uh, Clement, Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, Ephraim the Syrian, they all use the image of the Bible as the liar of the spirit, L-I-L-Y-R-E, not the liar, the liar <laughs> of, of the spirit, the inexhaustible source of spiritual and theological reflection, but only insofar as the spirit plays the strings, you know, makes it ever anew the occasion of Christ's manifold self disclosure to the mind of the church and of the believing Christian. Apart from that mystery, the truths of faith are not to be found in the text in any but, frankly, the most elliptically suggestive and fragmentary form. I mean, to give an example, I, I don't know, again, um, have met, any of you read Gregory of Nyssa's Life of Moses? That would probably be the best example of an allegorical text that's widely available. You have to read it. You can't be theologians if you haven't read. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa. So, um, <laughs> um, and this, this I, I mentioned that one just because there was a Paulist press edition that came out in the 70s, which has never gone, and it's still in print, and it's become a lot of the teaching of the of, of patristic exegesis and patristic spirituality. That's the, the preferred text. It's a beautiful book. And, and um, since you haven't read it, now I have to, now, now my reference I have to explain. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a magnificent example of patristic a, a allegory, what's actually going on. Uh, Gregory first recounts the literal story of Moses as recounted in the books of Moses. He tells his life story. That's part one. Part two, the exegetical part, is a magnificent allegory, one of the most theologically illuminating uh, uh, readings of Torah that you're going to find in the golden age of, of patristic literature. Now, no one, and, and, and if, if you read this, though, you would have the thing, you, and, and you will read it, I'm sure, now that I've suggested it. Um, you should not for imagine, imagine for a moment that Gregory is proposing his reading as the correct reading. It is a true reading, but it's not a, the single or exclusive or exhaustive correct reading. But, again, as I said, it is a true reading, an interpretation that truly speaks of Christ in the light of the Spirit who leads into all truth. Let, let me step back a moment and say this. Um, the more that the modern Christian self-understanding came to depend on the view of the Bible as the unique repository of inspired truth, and as of itself the sole and sufficient source of Christian belief, which you may have guessed, guessed by now I don't believe, the more inevitable a critical reaction became. And the more the Christians came to vest their faith in the literal text of scripture and the myth of the Bible's textual and theological uniformity, the more inevitable it became that such a critical reaction would take the form of a kind of reverse literalism. The discovery not only of the heterogeneity of the text, but of its theological fluidity, and this ineluctably took the form not of a return to the older model of reading that had been basically forgotten, but as a practice of critique without reserve, without term, and of course without much theological issue. 
Once the Bible had been thoroughly mythologized as the oracular deposit of the faith, the demythologization that followed could be nothing more than the discovery that, uh, in fact, the articles of faith are not there in its pages in a way that's absolutely lucid. It is not only that a genuinely literalist reading of the Bible is self-evidently absurd. I mean, a genuinely literalist. I mean, like a fundamentalist reading. Uh, irreconcilable with the text's contradictions, incapable of making sense of the multivalency of the text's sources, dependent upon an almost willful refusal to, to recognize any difference between myth and history. I mean, this is the great reaction to the reaction, especially in America in the early 20th century, the, the absolute fundamentalism. It is more the case that the Bible, as the book that early modern theology required it to be, simply does not exist. The more closely one looks at the text, the more, the, the more this alleged book begins to fall apart. It is not there. Read strictly ad literam, scripture simply does not say what we want it to say in the way we want it to say it. Now, I mean not only that the text is not always consonant with theological readings. Okay? That, that's a different matter. For instance, Western theology has the whole Augustinian reading, say, of Paul's theology of grace shared in common Catholics, Protestants. I believe that is a profoundly defective reading of Paul, that Augustine got it very badly wrong in many respects with, with bad consequences for later theology. But that, that's a matter of simple exegesis of, of theology. Rather, uh, that's just a matter of reading or misreading. One of us has got it wrong. I mean even something more radical, something that's, that you see in the stories of the Old Testament, that many of the most basic elements of faith, the most fundamental narratives upon which the story of salvation depend, are not situated in the text, except in an ambiguous and coit way, or rather, to be more honest, uh, situated in, a tradition, in the text in a certain tradition of reading the text. And this is why there has never really been and can never really be a functioning Christian community that truly reads the Bible literally, not in the sense that we give the word literally today. Even these modern fundamentalists I mentioned, contre coeur, are not really reading the text of Scripture, so much as using the text as the occasion to reiterate yet again the story that Christians tell of how things stand between creation and God. <laughs> 